Hello, my name's uh, Matthew Stibbe. I'm a professor of modern European history at Sheffield Hallam University and a specialist in First World War studies, in particular in the history of civilian internment as a global phenomenon during the period 1914 to 1920. I've been asked to talk today um, to today about my recent research into mental health and First World War internment. And this began um, uh, just um, over a year ago in April, May 2019, when I was lucky enough to have a two week fellowship at the National Library of Medicine in Bethesda in Maryland, where I went to research papers in, in, in English, French and German on uh, mental health uh, during um, uh, con under conditions of internment. And in particular, I was interested in the publication uh, by a Swiss medical doctor, Adolf Lucas Fischer, called Barbed Wire Disease, a book or really a pamphlet uh, that he published first in German in 1918 and then in English translation in 1919. I was interested in finding out why Fischer's book on barbed wire disease and why the phrase or the term barbed wire disease in general was not taken up by medical professionals at the time to the same extent as the term shell shock um, was taken up. So I, I spent a couple of weeks in uh, Maryland just over a year ago um, and at that time uh, neither I nor any of us could foresee where we would be in uh, 2020 with the COVID um, uh, pandemic and the uh, lockdown in the UK and in various other parts of the world. And I'm sure as you're aware, the um, uh, um, from media reports, there's a lot of concern at the moment about the uh, mental health impact of the lockdown and accompanying social isolation and uncertainty, both the um, immediate mental em uh, health impact which is um, already quite well known about, and the medium and long term impact, which is partly unknown or and perhaps even partly unpredictable. So suddenly my research uh, seems to have a contemporary relevance that it may not have done just a year ago. Um, now, when we think about um, the uh, lockdown today and First World War internment, it's worth saying at the beginning that there are obviously a great many differences. Um, one key difference is on the kind of person that it affected. First World War internment affected people of, of all social classes, but by and large, the population of First World War internment camps was quite homogenous. People from various social backgrounds, but usually white um, and, age, um, and age between 17 and into their late 40s. Whereas today, of course, those who are um, under lockdown represent a far more um, heterogeneous uh, population, both well, in terms of age, in terms of gender, in terms of race and ethnicity, um, as well as in terms of social class. Um, we also know that people today have um, many more opportunities to communicate with families, even if they're isolated physically from families. Um, we have um, internet, phone, social media, um, whereas at best, people in internment in the First World War had very slow uh, 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 system through the Red Cross of communicating by postcard and letter uh, with families at home. So there are obvious and important differences that we should not forget. On the other hand, there are some very significant similarities. In particular, um, the similarity over uncertainty about how long um, the ordeal will last, how long First World War internment would last was unknown to the prisoners when they would be released unknown and likewise when the lockdown will end when the pandemic will end when we will get back to normal if there is such a thing as getting back to normal it's unknown to us still um, as i speak so uncertainty over time and also uncertainties over the future of businesses employment opportunities um, uh, whether or not um, uh, your government will um, give you a, a, a suitable co financial compensation package. That was un uh, very uncertain for people at the time. The future becomes uh, very much unknowable and uncontrollable. And I think that has, for that reason too, there are certain similarities um, between First World War internment and the current lockdown, which makes this topic uh, 
um, worth exploring. Now I'm going to put some um, of my um, slides now on the screen to talk you through my slides for the lecture. So you're going to lose me. I have my slides um, coming up on the screen. Um, there we are. I hope you can see them now. Um, and they should be up on the screen. I'm just going to make sure you I can see now that the slides have come up on the screen. So my talk will be on mental health impact of the First World War internment, in particular on Adolf Luca, Lucas Fischer's book, Barbed Wire Disease and its um, reception. So I'll start by looking at his, um, his books. And we can see um, in the first instance, um, uh, I hope you can see on your screens the uh, um, the, two, the, the, the on the left hand side the German version, the original version of his book Stackeldraht Krankheit, and then um, the English translation on the right, which had an introduction by an Anglo American surgeon um, Samuel Alexander Kinya Wilson um, in it, which I'll also discuss later on in the um, lecture. It's interesting to note from this, of course, that. Barbed wire disease was not just a concept in the Anglosphere, it crossed borders. Its origins may well have been German or Swiss German, Stackeldraht, Krankheit. Um, I also believe there was an Italian translation of this book, although I've never seen it. Um, uh, um, there wasn't a French translation, and I will address what the question of why not later on um, uh, as well. But there we have the, 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 the front covers of the of the two books um, in question. Um, next, we want to think about who Adolf Lukas Fischer was. Um, uh, he was a medical doctor from Basel in the German part of um, Switzerland. And before he wrote the book, he already had several years of experience working abroad and in Switzerland for the Red Cross and similar organizations. In particular, he um, as a Swiss medic uh, uh, and on behalf of the Swiss Red Cross, he visited um, Serbia and the Macedonian front during the first Balkan war um, um, uh, towards the end of 1912. He was both in, in Belgrade and on the Macedonian front. And he published a book about this in 1913, um, about his experiences, including a field surgery. And he, um, is this publication in 1913 is very typical of the time in having um, certain making certain cultural assumptions about the Balkan peoples that they were not quite European or quite as civilized as Western European countries. Um, he mentioned, for instance, that the officers in the Serbian army came from the same, same peasant background as the ordinary soldiers and had the same brutal and tribalistic instincts. He assumed as did others um, of, his, of his time that if the Western European uh, countries ever went to war, they would um, behave in more civilized ways that they would so that they, they had signed up to the Hague and the Geneva Conventions. Um, this was, as I said, a very typical um, uh, uh, imagery of the Balkans, which you can all also find at the time in publications, for instance, the Carnegie Foundation's report on the Balkan Wars, which was published in 1914. But what's interesting about Vischer is that his um, views were challenged um, on this, or some of his assumptions were challenged by his experiences during the First World War in three different contexts. Firstly, he was involved in a cross mission to uh, modern day Iraq, to Mesopotamia in 1916, where he uh, undertook a mission looking after British Indian soldiers who'd been captured by Turkish forces. And here he found that many of his cultural prejudices about, about non-Western prisoners uh, were challenged. Secondly, he was involved in the care of um, military and civilian prisoners of war who were transferred from enemy captivity into neutral Swiss captivity in 1916 on the ground of ill health. Um, in 1916, the Swiss government signed uh, agreements with Britain, France, Belgium, uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary to allow certain categories of ill prisoner to be transferred from enemy camps into neutral Swiss um, camps. And there they were looked after by Swiss medics. And if they were, um, if after three months they had not recovered 
particularly well and were deemed permanently unfit for um, uh, military service, they could then be repatriated home. If they were if they were cured, they were able to stay in neutral internment in Switzerland for, for the duration. The point about this is that both Misha and some of his um, uh, um, military army colleagues, medical colleagues, have noticed that alongside many of the physical ailments that prisoners were uh, facing, they also were facing significant mental health impairment that continued even in the relative comfort and good conditions of Swiss prison of war camps. So you could cure a prisoner of any phys you could cure a prisoner of certain physical ailments and uh, hold them in, in some of the camps in Switzerland were in effect um, hotels that were being uh, leased out to the Swiss army um, during the war. Um, but the mental health um, impact continued even in these better conditions of um, internment. Thirdly, Vischer then went to London as a special attaché to the Swiss legation there because in 1917 um, America um, broke relations with the central powers and um, ceased to be a protecting power for Germans in Britain and Switzerland took over that role. So suddenly in 1917 Switzerland is now responsible for visiting Germans who are held in British um, prisoner of war camps. And he, as, that, as a special attaché um, during the years 1917 to 19, among other things, Vischer visited many POW military camps and civilian camps and hospital wings that were holding um, enemy prisoners on the UK mainland, once to Ireland, and uh, perhaps most importantly of all for this talk, um, several times to the Isle of Man, which was where the where camps purely for civilian Germans uh, were based. Um, so he spent that time uh, in 1917 to 1919 in Britain. After 1919, he returned to Basel and he made a quite a dramatic um, switch towards gerontology, towards the study of the ageing process, and um, wrote several books about the ageing process, some of which you might be able to find because they're translated um, into English. And you can see that he himself lived, you can see he lived till 1974, so he's either 89 or 90, he lived himself to a long age. Um, although there is um, no direct connection between his earlier studies of prisoners of war and his later study of the ageing process, some of the ideas about the human spirit that he uh, um, gained during his earlier part of his career, I think we can see written into his writings on um, the ageing process. So that's um, Vischer himself and now I want to come on to look at the origins of the term barbed wire disease because although Vischer wrote the book um, he did not invent the term. The term already existed uh, before he, his publication of his book and indeed before he came to London. Now what are the origins of the term? Um, certainly, um, we know that it appeared in the first, for the first time in the First World War, but um, the origins are nonetheless a little bit obscure, and it's not clear whether that's first used in relation to military POWs or in relation to civilian internees. In fact, both kinds of prisoner were probably equally vulnerable to this um, condition. Nor is it clear whether it was first used by prisoners themselves or by outside observers, whether it began use inside camps and then came outside camps or, or its origins are outside the camps and entered into the camps. Nonetheless, um, we can find the first mentions or use of the term barbed wire disease in camp newspapers in Britain and Germany in 1915-1916. It was a term that Swiss doctors who began treating um, uh, um, sick POWs who were transferred into neutral internment, um, they began using it from 1916 onwards. And by 1917, it had entered the language of international diplomacy. For um, the first international exchange agreement to explicitly recognize and use the term barbed wire disease um, and, um, was the uh, agreement between Britain and Germany negotiated via Dutch. Um, mediation at The Hague in July 1917. And for the first time, 
barbed wire disease was um, named as one of several conditions that could uh, allow a prisoner to be transferred from enemy captivity um, in Britain or Germany into new Dutch captivity. So the first time mental health, a prisoner could be physically healthy, but nonetheless deemed to be suffering from barbed wire disease and therefore potentially eligible to um, uh, be exchanged. Um, and that the, the, the agreement at The Hague was the first time, but by 1918, the term was being regularly um, written into uh, all kinds of exchange agreements um, between um, enemy countries. Some of the Turkish uh, agreements signed between Turkey and the Allies were also using it by 1918, for instance. But the point that I wanted to make here, of course, is that when Vischer came to London in 1917, the term uh, was already being used and he himself began to use it in some of his inspection reports. Now, as I said, he went um, on inspections to various military and prisoner of war camps um, uh, on the British mainland and including to hospital wings. Um, but the most important visit he made as far as collecting evidence for his books on barbed wire disease was the, um, the, the week-long visit that he made to the Isle of Man in November 1917. Not, not his first visit, in fact his third visit to the Isle of Man, but this time he stayed for a whole week and wrote reports on both the Nokelo camp um, on the west of the island and on the privileged Douglas camp um, on the east of the island where those prisoners, German prisoners who could afford to pay for better conditions um, were living. Now the reports are available in the National Archives in Kew in Surrey and it's interesting that he's already using this term barbed wire disease. On the slide there I put the beginning page and the end page of his report, you can see his signature there on the right hand side, of his report to the Swiss legation on his uh, visit to the Isle of Man in November um, 1917. Um, what were the symptoms of barbed wire disease that he described first in his reports and later in more detail in his book? He spent, um, during his time um, in the Isle of Man, he spent um, uh, um, four days inside Nokele, visiting all four sections of the camp and the hospital um, and speaking to various um, uh, prisoners and camp committees and he spent a day visit into the camp at Douglas and he observed barbed wire disease in both camps. These are the symptoms that he described, prisoners describing to him. Sexual difficulties, excessive smoking, a taste for gambling and idle gossip. Um, Vischer was uh, very um, uh, uh, opposed to gambling. Uh, he felt that this was uh, not a, um, uh, something that was good for the mental health of the prisoners. And one of the things that he wrote about in his, his report to the Swiss legation at Nocale, um was his objection to um, the fact that under the terms of the Hague Agreement signed between Britain and Germany in July 1917, around 100 criminals who've been convicted, German criminals who've been convicted in British ports and were hitherto serving time in British prisons were transferred to the Nokelo camp. And he blamed them for the rise in gambling and the rise in tensions in the camp in general. And he suggested in the report a Swiss legation request that the criminal prisoners, the criminal convicts inside the Nokelo camp, be separated from the rest of the prisoners. Um, so taste for gambling, idle gossip, sleeplessness and restlessness, irritability, difficulty in concentrating. And it's interesting because so many other reports on internment camps talk about the importance of theatre and orchestras and music for um, distracting the prisoners and keeping them happy. But he found prisoners complaining that they had seen too many musical and theatrical performances and that their mental health was such that they couldn't bear to spend more than five minutes sitting down and watching them. Problems with memory or short-term memory loss, 
and a dismal outlook on the future in general. These are the key symptoms that he, he found by talking to prisoners. His book, um, his reports in his book are not written in particularly convoluted medical language. They are reports of um, uh, what prisoners, what he observed himself and what prisoners um, said to him whilst in the camps. What are the implications of vicious findings um, in terms of knowledge about mental health problems for people uh, in internment, in imprisonment, in lockdown situations? Well, firstly, whereas a lot of previous literature has focused on the spatial aspects of internment, the, the, the loss of freedom of movement for prisoners, Vischer felt that the main in mental health impact, to understand the main mental health impact of internment, we need to focus on the temporal dimension, the fact that people did not know how long, in terms of time, their ordeal would last. Um, and the fact that it clearly, by the time he went to Nokelo, he was meeting prisoners in November 1917, some of whom had already been in internment for at least three years. So emphasis on the temporal rather than the uh, spatial. Secondly, I take two key um, aspects of two, two key aspects of medical knowledge, um, two competing theories of human development um, that were um, in very much in vogue during the First World War era. And I'm sure real experts in Darwin and Freudian theory would would uh, uh, argue that I'm grossly oversimplifying. But I will, in 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 um, in general terms, Vischer. Um, uh, rejected both the Darwinian and Freudian theories, at least implicitly. Now, Darwinian theory would suggest that the fittest survive, and they survive by adapting to any given environment that they might find themselves in. Whereas Vicious' point in his book was that the internment camp was such an inhuman um, and alienating, alienating environment that no human being, um, whatever their um, degree of health and skills before they enter the camp, could adapt to life within it, at least after the first few months, that it is an inhuman environment. Humans are not adapted, are not suited to adapting to this environment full stop. In fact, he compared the internment camp to the Arctic and Antarctic and suggested that just like these environments are not suited to prolonged human habitation, neither is the barbed wire camp. Freudian theories of um, captivity might suggest, and mental health problems in captivity might suggest that the uh, prisoners um, uh, experience some kind of infantile regression whilst in the camps, that they become helplessly dependent on the guards, just like when they were small babies, they were helplessly dependent on their parents. And this creates in the first instance, um, a, a feelings of aggression towards those that they are dependent on, and then this aggression is, in, because it cannot be released, um, this aggression is then turned inwards in in um, in the shape of mental health um, problems. Um, so prisoners experience some kind of infantile um, regression. Vischer rejected this. He said uh, on two grounds. Firstly, he he was very keen to suggest that the prisoners that he met were all well-adjusted adults before they entered the camp. They were not children, they were not experiencing regression into childhood. These were all um, young men who had um, developed um, uh, into adulthood perfectly well. I think that's why he was also so keen to separate the criminal prisoners um, from the other prisoners. Um, Vischer shared a rather 19th century view that criminal types were already um, uh, predisposed towards their crime, towards the criminal behaviour. That they, By definition, they must already have been um, uh, uh, criminally minded, um, uh, um, psychologically um, uh, different, um, even before they committed their crimes. Whereas um, uh, uh, the, the, the prisoners he met in Nokelo, he said, were well adjusted. And secondly, he said they were perfectly capable of um, explaining their symptoms um, in straightforward terms. They were not, these, these symptoms were not 
unconscious symptoms in the Freudian sense. They were perfectly conscious and aware and capable of verbalizing their symptoms. Um, another implication of Fisher's work, which is very important uh, and um, led, him, led, led him to challenge some of his own previous assumptions, particularly from the time that he was visiting Serbia in 1912, is that barbed wire is something that prisoners of all social classes and all ethnicities and all um, levels of education were equally to. The symptoms began after six months and they grew worse over time with all prisoners. It's a degenerative condition and it cannot be um, uh, mitigated by differences in class or ethnicity. Um, it's, an, it's a universal human phenomenon that after six months or more in this kind of captivity, significant mental health difficulties will arise irrespective of class, irrespective of ethnicity or race, irrespective of previous level of um, education. Of course, this fits into his idea that the camp environment is a uniquely unhuman um, environment. Carrying on with a couple more um, implications, important implications of his work. The only answer to barbed wire disease, Fisher argued in his book, was to release all civilian internees, not just the very sick who might have a chance of being placed on the exchange programs being uh, for the, under the Hague Agreement and other agreements, but all prisoners needed to be released immediately, said Fisher. Um, and secondly, he said, even release is not a cure for barbed wire disease. It's just a step in the right direction towards a very gradual and slow condition. In fact, Fisher predicted that recovery will be slow and uncertain, and the long term, there would be long term health implications for those affected. He predicted that post war Europe would be inundated with health, with previously healthy young men who were suffering from long term mental health problems, even after any of the physical ailments they may have accrued during the war were long past. So immediate release, yes, but he was still very uncertain about the long term prognosis for those suffering from barbed wire disease. Um, and uh, like many people today under the COVID um, uh, um, pandemic are worried that simply that the long term mental health consequences are unpredictable, but likely to be very severe, very bad. Um, is what he said in his book. Now, how was his book received? Um, and his book was received rather critically. Um, he, his, his ideas, his arguments, um, uh, confronted a number of vested interests. Um, it was, his conclusions were very pessimistic and contemporaries who read his book were rather disturbed by reading it. Um, in particular, when I was in uh, Bethesda in Maryland, I was reading medical works, medical journals and uh, medical publications and found that many medical professionals were very sceptical about Vicious um, uh, argument about the uniqueness of the camp environment. They felt there were many other environments, prisons, schools, boarding schools, um, uh, uh, hospitals that had similarities with the camp environment. So uh, they were sceptical about his claims to the um, about the, the, the uniqueness of the barbed wire camp. Um, Samuel Alexander Pinier Wilson, who we mentioned, who wrote a, a fairly friendly but quite critical foreword to the English translation of Fisher's book, he, he wondered just how scientific Fisher's observations were. And particularly, he picked Fisher up for failing to consider the impact of the mental health conditions of prisoners before they went into captivity. Pinier Wilson suspected that those who suffered most from barbed wire disease probably already had some underlying health conditions before they went into captivity, or at least he felt that Vischer had not ruled this out scientifically. So the medical profession was sceptical. Um, they were sceptical of Vischer's methodology. Um, governments were sceptical. Now, by 1917-18, some governments, in fact, many of the warring governments, um, were willing to negotiate limited exchange agreements for prisoners who were suffering particularly severe forms of physical and mental illness. 
but none of them were willing to end civilian internment entirely, to let all prisoners go, go. and none of them were willing to accept that um, imprisoning civilians for more than six months um, in captivity um, was inhumane and absolutely unacceptable, as Fisher uh, argued. Um, they still felt that military necessity um, uh, outweighed any humanitarian objections, except perhaps for those who were suffering um, the worst kind of Ill, uh, 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 at the extreme end of um, mental health problems. Other criticisms came from humanitarian groups. Now, what's interesting is that the from Fisher's um, uh, Vicious report uh, to the Swiss legation, we know that the uh, Quakers, the Friends Emergency Committee and its representatives in Nocolet played a, uh, an important role in uh, allowing Vicious to stay there for four days in November 1917. And of course, the Friends Emergency Committee um, sent in a lot of um, arts, crafts, books, sports equipment and so forth into camps like Nocolo and elsewhere in order to provide distractions for um, the prisoners. Um, what they disliked about Vicious book is the notion that after six months or so, nothing can mitigate the mental health impact of um, internment except release. Um, groups like the Quakers and the Red Cross were also campaigning for much wider release schemes. I'm sure the Friends Emergency Committee would have supported universal release and indeed they did they did campaign for that. But alongside that, they also felt that their, um, active, their philanthropic activities were helping to mitigate um, the effects of internment by giving prisoners something to do. Um, and of course, Vicious' very pessimistic conclusions rather suggested that they might be wasting their time. Interestingly, um, uh, in the English language version of Vicious' book, um, the publisher allowed um, somebody whose name is only um, uh, given as X um, to um, write some comments in footnotes on Vicious' work. And almost certainly, the records I've seen in the Friends, Society of Friends Library suggest almost certainly that th those criticisms came from someone in the uh, Friends Emergency Committee, probably its then secretary. So humanitarian groups. And then finally, I said that I discovered when I was reading pamphlets that French medical experts were particularly hostile, more hostile than British and German experts to the phrase barbed wire disease. And they preferred to hang on to a previous um, concept um, that um, French military doctors were already familiar with, known as le cafard. Uh, le cafard is a kind of depression which the French army and the French Foreign Legion, interestingly, identified in young army recruits going back before the war. So it's a kind of homesickness, the Cafar, um, uh, that um, recruits into the French army or into the Foreign Legion might experience in their early weeks and months of training. But in the French literature, le Cafar is not something, is not a de de degenerative condition that gets worse over time. Um, but something that most normal or healthy recruits will must overcome in a masculine way. It's part of the journey that turns them from civilians into uh, uh, masculine uh, soldiers. Only the weak or deviant um, would fail to overcome le cafard, said French medical experts. Um, uh, only the weak would be prove themselves to be unsuited to army or to camp life. So the, it's interesting um, that the that although Vischer came from a Swiss, Switzerland, which is a French speaking as well as a German speaking country, his book was not translated into French. And by and large, although there were some references um, to um, barbed wire disease in French camp newspapers, le cafard was still the preferred term because uh, barbed wire disease was seen as somehow emasculating um, uh, French soldiers and, uh, um, uh, rather than allowing them to overcome a condition, a form of depression through their own uh, will. So that will be the Christians of Vision would help to explain, I think, why his work um, did not take hold to the same degree as the work 
that Serge did um, on uh, 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 the medical expert, sorry, did on um, uh, um, shell shock. But nonetheless, Fisher did have a legacy. I've suggested to you that barbed wire disease does not take off in the medical profession, like shell shock did. Um, it does appear a little bit in the Second World War, but other terms like neurasthenia are preferred in the Second World War. Um, by from expert outside observers, experts, medical personnel, Red Cross personnel, and so forth. But um, from what I've seen, internees may well have been convinced by um, Vicious' findings. They liked his method uh, rather than you just using abstract medical terms and uh, making assumptions without ever talking to prisoners about their experiences. Vicious was one of the first people to actually. Um, uh, focus on prisoners' own accounts of why they thought they had become um, mentally ill during captivity. His book did not label them as deviant or infantile or weak or unable to adapt. Um, his, he he, he rehumanised um, the prisoners and let them speak for themselves. Also, his focus on the temporal dimension of internment, I think, was very important. Um, Obviously, there have been um, uh, forms of captivity before the First World War in the various 19th century conflicts, um, um, uh, short term forms of internment. But what was new about the First World War was not only the global reach of prisoner of war camps and civilian internment camps in Europe, but much further afield, uh, we can find uh, prisoner of war camps, but the, the length of time that people were in internment. And some of you may well know the book by Paul Cohen, Port Time, Time Stood Still, 1914 to 1918. Some of the chapter headings in that book clearly suggest that Cohen, Port Time, had read Fisher. Cohen, Port Time, was imprisoned briefly at Nocolet on the Isle of Man and then for a longer period in um, uh, Lofthouse Park near Wakefield in Yorkshire. Um, and his book is one of the um, uh, uh, key eyewitness accounts, internee accounts. It was published in 1931. So I think Vicious views, perhaps not so much um, uh, uh, convincing outside professionals, but certainly having uh, been more important for prisoners' understanding of themselves and their desire to be seen as human beings rather than just as patients or deviants um, of some kind. Um, and we can think about Vicious' legacy as well when we move on to think about um, the situation today. Now, of course, I've already been talking about the very recent experience, um, unprecedented experience for any of us, I guess, of the um, COVID lockdown. But another thing, another uh, um, aspect of contemporary life that vicious findings might have uh, uh, help us to understand is the phenomenon of immigration detention. Um, today, in Britain, several hundred, and in other countries, particularly the United States, America, but elsewhere as well, there are on any on any given day going to be several hundred people, at least thousands, maybe in immigration detention, awaiting um, either successful appeals, which means that they won't be deported or awaiting their deportation. And there's quite a lot of literature today on mental health and immigration detention. Um, I've picked in particular, I picked on Mary Bosworth's book. Inside Immigration Detention, a very good book that I recommend. And one of the interesting things, she doesn't, she and others do not mention barbed wire disease. I've not seen that mentioned in any of this literature. But rather like Fisher, Mary Bosworth um, decided that the only way to understand mental health um, among detainees was to go inside and talk to them. That's the reason of the title of her book, Inside immigration detention. She and her research um, uh, uh, assistants uh, went inside immigration detention centres in uh, in the late noughties and the early part of the 2010s um, in order to do field work, just like Vischer um, went into Nokelo for his field work. Um, although they don't use the term barbed wire disease, like Vischer, they note that um, the difference between immigration detainees and ordinary prisoners in criminal prisons. And for them, the, the key difference is that um, in criminal prisons, uh, um, uh, prisoners are still um, 
in theory at least I, obviously i know that the um the practice is not um always as um uh, as it should be but in theory criminal prisoners are uh, given the prospect of a route back into society whereas those in immigration detention are uncertain about whether they'll even be allowed back into British society if we're talking about Britain even if they have lived there all or most of their adult life they are taken out of their own lives in a way that criminal prisoners prisoners are not um, and uh, that may apply um, what well, that that applies to immigration detention today to uh, in some cases to what happened to the members of the Windrush generation who having lived in Britain nearly all their lives suddenly found themselves in immigration detention and if you think about it in the first world war camps like on the Isle of Man many of the Germans there had lived in Britain since childhood and um, uh, or young adulthood and they again they was they were being alienated from their own past and their own futures um, they were being taken out of society and they did not know whether there would be a route back into it. And the second finding um, that is important in this respect is um, just like Vischer, they found that, that mental health problems in immigration detention are degener de uh, degenerative, they get worse over time. The longer someone is in immigration detention, the longer, the more likely they are to suffer a mental health conditions, uh, poor mental health and uh, the worse their mental health symptoms will become. Um, now, some uh, uh, people in immigration detention are, um, uh, are, are there because they won't accept voluntary repatriation and they are uh, continuing with legal appeals. But under the COVID crisis, um, of course, there are no, even if you were in inverted commas under duress to volunteer to be repatriated and to cease with legal appeals, um, you wouldn't be able to leave today because there's no planes flying anywhere because of the COVID crisis. So again, that would further add to the very severe implications on us all with COVID that, that being in immigration detention during COVID has its own particular burdens as well. Various, um, in recent years, uh, various select committees of MPs have recommended the maximum time in immigration detention should be 28 days. And the government has not committed to that absolutely, um, but has um, agreed that that should be the ideal target. But I think, again, particularly with COVID now, I expect my suspicion is that there'll be people in immigration detention who've been there for a lot longer um, than 28 days. So that will be, again, another way of thinking about Fisher's impact for the world as we know it um, today. Now, I just want to end my talk. Um, I hope you'll forgive me for this, for a couple of um, famous plugs for my own work. Um, if you're interested in following up some of my research in more detail. Firstly, on the left here, I wrote um, uh, over 10 years ago now a book on the Ruhleben camp near Berlin for British civilian internees held in Germany during the First World War. And the final chapter of that book does have some information about um, the long-term mental health impact on uh, British civilians who returned to Britain in 1918 at the end of the war, having spent four years or so in the Ruhleben camp. Um, more recently, I have published just, just before Christmas a, a new book with Palgrave Macmillan on civilian internment during the First World War, this time a European and global history. And chapter five of that book has an extensive section on Vischer and the mental health consequences of internment um, as, glo as a global phenomenon. Um, and just moving to my final slide, um, the, uh, uh, of course the, those two books are available for purchase, but I also have things that you can download for free. Um, I wrote, after I had been in Bethesda, I wrote a blog on my findings at the National Library of Medicine in Bethesda, um, which was published in January, and you can download that for free. That's a short piece um, on uh, Vischer and his critics and then very recently um, at the beginning of last week um, the Western Front Association interviewed me for a podcast about my new book um, which uh, on, on global the global history of civilian internment um, uh, and that is uh, again available for download there 
as episode number 161. So um, uh, thank you for um, uh, listening to my uh, lecture today and I uh, please do feel free to download those um, those two, um, uh, the blog and the podcast if you're interested in following this up. Thank you and goodbye.